right, so let's begin. Justin, are we on? Okay. Let's begin um, with the seven churches, but before we do that, we have to get into an intro to the seven churches. So you can find this in Revelation chapter 2. An introduction to seven churches is really interesting that all seven messages um, begin alike. They also conclude alike. So in every single message to the different churches, so whether it's Ephesus or Smyrna or Thyatira or Sardis or Philadelphia or Laodicea, um, I forgot the other one off the top of my head. Um, anyways, what, what, uh, whichever one it is, they all begin alike and conclude alike. They begin with the greeting to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Write this, right? Um, likewise, they all end with a farewell. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So they all begin with, to the angel, write these things. You know, what's an angel? A messenger, right? So the messenger of the churches write these things, and they all begin that same way. And then likewise, they all end with the farewell. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, you know when Jesus was talking, and he would say, he'd speak a parable, and then he would say, he let, you know, he who has ears, let him hear, right? What is, what is the meaning of that expression? What is he trying to convey in saying that to us? It's, it's, what's that? Desire understanding. What did you say, Tiffany? Are you listening? Right. right. It's, it's a general, it's a message going out to everybody like, listen, this is for everybody. You need to pay attention to what I'm saying. You need to heed what I'm saying because this is important, right? It's like the equivalent of a pastor saying, and I do this a lot in my sermons, um, if you get nothing else from this, get this from it, right? Take this from it, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. Um, and then every Christian living in these particular churches was urged to heed these messages, obviously, for that reason. Okay? So every appeal to the churches also contains a promise to the one who overcomes. And there is a steady decline in spirituality with each successive church. So remember, when we look at these seven churches, um, there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's a process that we're going to go through. And I think it comes later in the slides. Um, but if it doesn't, remind me of the process. But basically, we're going to talk about the historical application, the prophetic application, and the universal application. All right? So we'll hopefully go through that in more detail in this slide a little bit later. Every church has something good said about it, except for which church? Laodicea, right? Every other church has something good said, but to the Laodicean church, he says, I want to spew you out. And why do you think that's important? That, but because we're Laodicea. That's our church. That's the church that represents this time, this age period. So we're going to look at that a little bit later, right? Okay, so every church has something good said about it except for Laodicea. But even though I say that, remember I said this on Sabbath, just because there's a message to the church, that doesn't mean that everybody in the church needed that message. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not everybody was doing those things. Not everybody was in a bad way. Some people are very on fire for God. They're moving in the right direction with God, and God's perfectly happy with them, even though they live in the church age of Laodicea. Most are lukewarm, and that's why this description is that way. And and some are cold, but that's better than being lukewarm. All right. As sin abounds, grace much more abounds. However, along with the evident spiritual decline in the churches, there is a proportionate increase in the promise Jesus gives. Although each church is in greater decline compared with the preceding one, each receives more promises than the previous one. So let's look at this concept. Ephesus is given one promise to obtain the tree of life, right? So in the church, to F, the message to Ephesus, and you can read this in chapter 2 and chapter 3 in your Bible. But anyways, in Ephesus, they're given one promise. And Smyrna is given two promises to have the crown of life and to escape from the second death. Pergamum is given three promises to have the hidden manna, to have a white stone, and to be called by a new name. Thyatira is given four promises to have the authority over the nations, to rule over the nations with an iron scepter, to dash the nations into pieces, and to be given the morning star. Sardis is given five promises to walk with Jesus, to be dressed in white robes, to have their names not be blotted out of the book of life, to be acknowledged before the Father, and to be acknowledged before the angels. Philadelphia is given six promises to be kept from the hour of trial, to be pillars in the temple, to never leave the temple, and to have the name of God, the name of the city of God, and, the, and God's new name written on them. And then we get to Laodicea, 
and the pattern breaks. So we have a, a promise added with every successive church. So the first church, Ephesus, gets one promise. The second church, um, Thyatira, gets two promises. But then, um, or Sardis, sorry, um, gets two promises. But then we get to Laodicea, and there's only one promise. Laodicea is given only one promise, to sit with Jesus on his throne. However, this promise incorporates all other promises that were made to the churches. To sit with Jesus on his throne means to have all of these promises. And go ahead. Is that compounded on the others? In other words, first church has one, the second church gets two, but they, do they get the two plus the one? Sort of. Okay. So some of the promises are alike and they kind of build off each other, but then we get to Laodicea and there's only just one promise. But what you're saying is true, but how is it true? So how does this promise encompass all of them? You're asking me, well, if you're there, <laughs> right, if you're there to go with this, right? All right, so never forget this point, all right? I know I've said this before, but this is something that we really need to focus on. Never forget this. So he who has ears, let him hear what I'm about to say, right? Don't forget this. The gift that God gives us isn't as important as the gift giver. Do you understand what I'm saying, right? And if we have the gift giver, who cares about the gift? Because we'll have whatever gift we need, right? We'll have whatever gift we want because we have the gift giver, amen? And when we link ourselves to Jesus, when we join to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. I want to be in a relationship with you. We get the what? We get the gift giver, the promises, right? And as long as we're walking with Jesus, then these are all for us. Because he said, if you ask anything in my name, it shall be what? Given you. Amen, right? So once you come to Jesus, you have the gift giver. So don't forget that. And that's why to Laodicea, this promise incorporates all other promises. Because they were to sit with Jesus on the throne. They had the ear of the gift giver, if you will. Amen. All right? So this increase in promise is in proportion to the spiritual decline in the churches. In other words, you know the verse um, in, in second Corinth, or 1 Corinthians 12, 9, um, in your weakness I am made strong and my grace is sufficient, right? Um, in other words, um, as, as the spiritual decline takes place in these churches, as, we, as this decline falls, spirituality fails or falls and, and sinks lower and lower, God's promises get stronger and stronger. And the same thing, you see the same pattern in your own life. In your own life, when you're tempted with sin and when you're struggling in sin and, and when you've fallen from sin and you can see in other people's lives who have, who've way, have, have separated themselves a long ways from God and have walked away a long ways from God, he says, my grace is sufficient. My power is sufficient to get you back. And God gives us what we need for the moment that we're in. Amen? He says, I've given you the measure of faith. All right. So it, it brings to mind Romans 5, more of the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Recognizing this pattern demonstrates the consistent and faithful commitment that Jesus has made to his church in each era. So... The, the, the best news about that is because this world is spiraling out of control, it's getting worse and worse, and we are getting weak and reader, weaker and weaker, but God comes alongside of us and does that which we can't do. God says, I'll be the power for your weakness. I'll be the strength for your inefficiencies. You understand what I'm saying? God says, I'll be what you're lacking. I will make up for that portion, right? And I don't know what the scale is, and I won't put any numbers on it because that would be ludicrous or stupid to even try. But my point is this. When every little kid is learning how to walk, right, and, and they first learn how to stand, what happens? The mom or the dad goes over there, and they grab the kid's hands because they're trying to stand, and they pull the kid up. And then the kid stands. You understand? So who stood, the kid or the parent? Both of them did. The kid was putting in just as much effort. You understand what I mean? And God's saying it's the same way with us. As long as we're working with him, he'll pull us up. He'll hold us by our hands and make us stand. And that's the point of this promises with this church. He says it's in proportion. I know that there's a, de a, 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 um, a declining spirituality here. He says, but... I can revive you out of it. I can elevate you to where I want you to be. I can make you an overcomer. And I don't care what you struggle with, and I don't care how long you've been struggling with it. What you need to understand is what Jesus is telling you. When you're with him, his grace is sufficient. He will make you an overcomer. So, um, 
Moving on. We should remember that the church, enfeebled and defective though it be, is the only object on, or, on earth on which Christ bestows his supreme regard. He is constantly watching it with solicitude and is strengthening it by his Holy Spirit. It's that second selected message is page 396. In other, regard, in other words, no matter how bad the church looks, no matter how bad it's failing, it's still Christ's supreme love on earth. And he'll make sure it it, 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 see, it sees its way through. Yes, yeah, sorry, I haven't been getting much sleep, so if I'm stuttering over words, I, I, I apologize. Keeping in mind that Jesus knows his church because he walks among them, this lesson is of the candlesticks. Matthew 28, 20 teaches us, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And he reminds us that we do not have to be afraid. He is the first and the last. He's God, and he's still in control no matter how bad things get down here. And, you know, I, I mean, we can... A lot of us have seen pain. A lot of us have seen trial. A lot of us have went through loss. And a lot of us have even been to the church and we've seen strife and fighting and backbiting and we've seen splits and we've seen all of this nonsense taking place. But Jesus says, it's still my bride. It's still my church and I'm going to be with it until the end. I am not giving up on it. And he's not giving up on us individually either. He says, you're still my child and I'm not giving up on you. He's going to fight and keep fighting until he can't fight any longer. The names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. So remember we talked about the the historical application of prophecy so as we go through these chur these churches we have to remember that this letter is actually written to who church to those churches right there was actually a church in ephesus right. there's actually a church in thyatira there's actually a church in sardis there's actually a church in pergamum you understand what i'm saying there's actually these churches and john is writing a letter to these churches and why is he writing a letter to these churches because Jesus has a message for those people in those churches. You understand what I'm saying? So that's a historical application. So there's actually a message for that. But then there's a prophetic application. Because as you study history, you'll see that these churches correspond with a period of time throughout the, throughout the, the age that we're in today. And, and we're going to look at that as we go through this. In other words, the first church, Ephesus, is the pure church. It, goes, it starts in AD 31 at the death of Christ when they start the new church. right? Um, and then it goes up to about 100 AD. And we're going to look at that a little bit later in the slides and that's the prophetic area of that church that's the time that it fulfills and then it moves on to the next church right um, and then they go on all the way through time and i'll show you how that works but never forget that we have that three that three-prong approach to studying this we have the historical application the application to the church itself and when we do that we have to look through the lens of the first century christians because that's what john was writing with right and then we have the prophetic application which is covering the, the span of the church and that will make more sense in a second but if i repeat myself over and over and over it'll stick it'll make sense right and then we have a universal application just because that was applied to that church long ago and just because it was for that time period long ago doesn't mean that when we read it jesus doesn't want to talk to us through it right because some of us have left our first love. You understand what I'm saying? Some of us have not held fast to what we first did and believed. You know what I mean? So, um, so Jesus would get our attention. So this is what she's commented on, Acts of the Apostles, page 585. The names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time. While the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So, the seven churches were actual churches with real challenges. These churches were located in important, prosperous cities on the main postal route that connected them. So, it's really interesting. If you look at these seven churches and this message house not went to these different seven churches, that's the Roman postal route. So when they were taking letters and post, they went to this church, then to this church, then to this church, then to this church. This is our post route that they're following, which I find interesting. I don't know why, but I did find it interesting. Anyways, so um, for the most part, these churches enjoy peacefulness under the Roman government, but our forced Roman, em Roman or forced emperor worship was becoming more of an issue, and especially in one church, and we're going to see that in a couple studies from now. Citizens were expected to be involved in the city's public events, as well as in participation in pagus, pagan religious ceremonies, and serious consequences awaited those who did not participate. So, you have to understand that this letter is a letter of comfort to these churches. 
And even though there's a rebuke in there, and even though they're being told what they're doing wrong, it's still a source of comfort because Jesus is promising to address their needs. Jesus is promising to take care of them, right? And isn't God great about that? Isn't that what's wonderful about Jesus? That even though he might give us a rebuke, even though he might tell us that something needs to change in our lives, even though he might tell us that we're not meeting up to the measure that he stepped for us and that we could do better and that he has a better plan and more blessings for us, he always gives us a promise. He always gives us help to achieve what he's asking us to do. He doesn't just chide us and walk away. He comes over and gently nudges us and then he grabs us and carries us if he needs to to get it done. That's what's beautiful about Jesus. That's what's beautiful about being a Christian. So here's this seven, the, the church is on this postal route. So here's the actual postal route. And my laser is too, it's not strong enough so you can't see. But it starts here at one in Ephesus. And then it goes to Smyrna and Pergamus and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. So um, that's the order they went in. And now, although originally sent to the churches in Asia Minor, these messages were not only written for them, just as Paul wrote his epistles primarily to the churches of his day, yet they still contain timeless messages for subsequent generations of Christians. The messages to each church contain valuable lessons that apply to Christians in all time periods. Have you ever wondered why there's a book called Romans? No? Just made sense to you? Huh? That's where Paul's message comes from. Right. Paul was writing to the Romans, right? Exactly. You ever wonder why there's a book, 1 Corinthians? What is Paul doing? He's writing to the Corinthians, right? Ephesians? You, you get it? You see what I'm saying? And so it's the same here too, right? Um, and could you imagine if we just said, well, Paul was writing that book for the Romans, so there's no implication for us today. Can you imagine if we took that attitude? We'd have to throw out half the, old, the New Testament. It'd be gone. It's ridiculous, right? Anyway, so just as, just as those books are, were written for those people and these books are written for these churches, the messages apply to us today. All right. The book of Revelation does not specify that the seven messages are written for as predictive history. However, since there were more than seven churches in Asia in the first century, and only these seven were selected as a symbolic function is applied. In other words, there were many more churches, but only these seven were chosen, right? And what have I told you? When you're studying the Bible, what is that? What is really happening there? God's given us a snippet of history, right? This is the history that God's given us. He could have filled book upon book upon book upon book upon book, right? In fact, John says that if we wrote down every deed that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough paper to contain it all, right? But this is what he's given us, and that means that every detail in here is what? Important, too, right? He's, there's a lesson in everything that we read and everything that we study here, right? So when we look at this, we have to go into the deeper things and figure out what the function is implied. And because we know there's only these seven churches, um, we know that this is talking about the time period. Do you have a question or you just wipe your nose? Okay. Um, all right. And then, of course, Revelation 1, 1 through 3 in verse 9 declares Revelation to be a book of prophecy. Therefore, we can understand that there should be a prophetic application to the book of Revelation because it's a prophetic book. All right. So let's go on. Format of each message. Each, each message follows the same format. One, it's an address. Two, it's an introduction of Jesus. Three, Jesus' appraisal of the church. Four, Jesus' counsel and warning to the church. Five, an appeal to hear the Spirit. And then six, promises to the overcomer. So that's how the format of the, each message comes to the churches. So let's look at the churches. So this is Ephesus, all right? This is modern-day Selkuk, Turkey. So if you were to go to the old Selkuk, Turkey now, that is where Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, was located. So, Revelation 2.1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So, do you guys remember what the stars are? That's a good answer. How do you know that? <laughs> I don't want you to say I told you, though. <laughs> right? It's in the last verse of chapter 1, right? Angels are, are the stars. And what are the candlesticks? Churches. Churches. Very good. All right. So, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. 
Ephesus, the meaning of Ephesus means it's desirable. It's a very desirable city. It's a very desirable place to live, right? So um, just like Mile is very desirable to live. That's why there's so many people out here. Um, you know, uh, this Ephesus was desirable. It was located on the Aegean Sea, is the capital city of the province of Asia, and had a population of about 250,000. So back in the day, that's a very large city. Uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a beautiful harbor situated on main highway for the region and held one of the seven wonders of the world, uh, the temple to Diana, the pagan goddess of fertility. And that was the ruins that you saw in that first picture of Ephesus. So um, this, is, this was a, 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 a live and well metropolis. Um, it was a beautiful place to be. It was like a hub, right? So if you drive through the Midwest, especially the upper Midwest, it's almost impossible to get to, 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 to anywhere on the West Coast without going through Chicago, right? Because it's a hub city. Ephesus is the same way. It's a hub city. It's where all the business kind of hubs to in this area, okay? So the prophetic time period of Ephesus represents the early Christian church. So from A.D. 31 to 100. So um, this is the time period of the formation of the church. So Christ was crucified in A.D. 31, and then the disciples started the church, right, through, through the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Um, and when all firsthand witnesses um, to Christ's life and work had passed on, then this era ended. This was the time period when Revelation was written around 90 A.D. Unfortunately, the period of apostolic church was nearly over when Revelation was written. So it would have been nice if the apostles were still around to interpret it for us. Revelation 2, 2 through 3, this is the message, the good. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have preserved and have patience, and have labored for my namesake, and have not become weary. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I also hate. So the commendation, the apostolic church was a pure church that would not tolerate heresy. They don't like the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Its labors had brought the gospel to the then known world. So if you read uh, about the early church, Paul says that the, every creature in the world has heard the gospel. And of course, he was talking about the then known world. Missionaries were sent all over the then known world. Souls were being won to Jesus every day. The Nicolaitans claimed to be Christian, but taught that obedience to God's law was unnecessary. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more because it comes up in another church. But the story doesn't end there. But I just want to stop. How would you like to be this description of you? If Jesus appraised you and he said this about you, how would you feel about that? If Jesus said, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and, they that, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Oh, man. I, I would run out the door. <laughs> I wouldn't want to give him time to hear what else he had to say. I mean, maybe I will because it's Jesus, but you understand what I mean? I'd be ecstatic to have this said about me, right? That's the good. This was a good church. And, and Jesus commends them because they don't like the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But there was that one little issue, the bad. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He was calling them back to that first love experience. He was calling them back to repentance and reformation. Without a burning love for Jesus in our hearts, our religion is useless. Have you lost your first love? Do you know how to get your first love back? Repent and go back to your first works, right? Remember that first time you came to Jesus and how it made you feel to know your sins were forgiven. That first time you came to Jesus and you had purpose in your life when you didn't before. That first time you came to Jesus and life suddenly meant something where it didn't before. That's your first love experience. And Jesus is telling us that he wants us to live in that experience. It's not just a phase we go through when we become a Christian. It's not just a honeymoon period, as people say. Jesus says this could be every day, every moment of your life. You can have this experience. And of course, he tells us what needs to happen. He says you need to repent. 
Do your first works and repent. All right, so Revelation 2, 7, the promise to Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God. The promise, through Jesus, all may become, all may be overcomers and have eternal life. Never forget that Christ's power in the life provides victory over sin and gives us holiness of character. Now, I just want to pause here again. I know that, you know, the last few sermons have been really marked on this, but holiness is important to God. Do you know what adjective is used to describe God more than any other adjective in the Bible? What? You're just too smart. That was supposed to be like, uh, I don't know, Pastor, tell me. And you just took my thunder. Good job. Yeah, the adjective used to describe God more than any other adjective in the Bible is the word Holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Why does he choose the word holy to describe his character? Because he's holy. Exactly. <laughs> he's holy, right? So he wants us to be what? Holy. Holy, because he wants us to be like who? Christ. Like him, right? So it makes sense that we would become holy. And, and remember, too, don't forget this point. I, 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 I repeat myself a lot. I understand that. But I do that because if I do, it'll stick in, Right? But don't forget this point. The angels are watching what's taking place down here. And why do you think they're watching? Yeah, they, they are the messengers. And, and they certainly want to see us saved. More than anything, they want to see us saved, right? But why are they so invested here? They want to be part of it. They want to be part of it, but who got cast out of heaven? Satan and the angels that followed him, right? And if you were an angel in heaven before they were cast out, who were you hanging out with? Yeah. These were your friends. These were your family members. And now they're not in heaven. And then Jesus comes and says, but Jay's coming up here. If you're an angel, you're going to be like, okay, God, I mean, I trust you. You're Jesus. But I mean, uh, Jay's coming up? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what, what about my friend that you kicked out, right? And so Jesus is doing, he's transforming us. He's fitting us for heaven. That's the part of holiness. That's the part of sanctification, right? And that's why it's important. But never forget that it's only because of our love for Jesus. And it only comes, we're only transformed because of his power, right? Just like that little kid can stand as long as mom or dad's holding them. Jesus can make us stand as long as we're hanging on to him. And if we're hanging on to him, why wouldn't we stand? What excuse do we have? All right. So, the reason why some lose their first love, why do you think that is? Why do you think some lose their first love? Well, what causes them to lose sight of Christ? I heard two things at the same time. I'm, you're too good. I'm going to Sharon. Get complacent? Okay, why? What brings the complacency? The world. The world, Why? You're there. I'm just going to keep fleshing it out. Try to figure out the words that I'm trying to say here. You don't go on vacation. You don't spend that special time with them. You okay. Okay, but what causes that transition? What causes that that fading? You, you pull away. You start. Lose the focus. <laughs> you know, when I when when I first became a Christian and I was in Oregon, there was this this lady that came down to talk to me. And she was married. It was her, her second husband. Um, and she was trying really hard. She had made some mistakes, but she was trying very hard to make things right and to get right with God and do all these things. And she was doing a very good job at doing that. Um, and she was certainly going in the right direction. Um, but she told me a story. She said, you know, I just, because I was single. And she said, I just miss being single. I'm like, why is that? Because you get to date anybody who's interesting to you. You just go on dates with them because you're single. And you can't do that when you're married. The reason why marriage was kind of a struggle for her, or part of the reason why, is because she missed what? 
She missed dating other people, right? The reason why we lose our first love for Jesus is because we love sin. It's our nature. Our natures are designed to tear us away from Jesus. Our nature is designed to pull us away from him because of the world, right? Because we love the world. We want to be of the world. We want to be a part of this world because it's enticing. It's, it's, it's exciting to us to be here, right? But Jesus is not of this world. You understand what I mean? So he's got to change our mind. And the reason why we lose our first love is because we don't keep walking with him, but we dwell too much on the world. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So observations from Ephesus. In putting all the emphasis on right actions and sound doctrine, the members were declining in love for Christ. And as a result, their love for each other faded. You know, it's really interesting here that, do you see what this says? Yeah. Jesus didn't rebuke them for their works. They were doing the right works. The devil doesn't care, brothers and sisters. He doesn't care if it's a good work or a bad work. If he can get you to focus on something other than Jesus, he will. You know, I, I remember I remember being saved by devotions. I was going to school upset, and I was saved by devotions. I think I preached about this, so I don't need to repeat it, but, you know, I, I was doing my devotions because if you do your devotions, you're saved. And it was taking the place of Christ. In other words, the method of doing devotions was my salvation instead of connecting with the God of the devotions. You understand what I mean? And that's what happened to Ephesus. They started putting Ephesus on right actions and sound doctrine. And there's nothing wrong with right actions and sound doctrine. We should be doing that, right? But let's make sure that our, our, our sound doctrine is, is pointing us to who? to Jesus, and let's make sure our right actions are an outflow of our love for Jesus and a response. God, I'm so thankful you did this for me. I'll go do anything for you. And the feelings that you get from it. So, the, six, the situation with Ephesus reflects the condition of Israel before the exile. So the Pharisees didn't have a problem with, with doing what God asked them to do for a lot of part, but because they lost the God of the actions, then they twisted it and made it human and satanic instead of Christ-like. Jeremiah 2, 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Could you imagine hearing Jesus say that to you? I remember. I remember when you came to me in your youth. I remember when you were driving that car and you realized you were a sinner, and you wanted something better, and you came to me, and you devoted yourself to me, and you started walking with me daily. You started praying with me daily. You started studying your Bible daily. I remember. That's the experience that Jesus wants with you right now. He remembers that time. It was sacred to him. It was special to him. And he remembers when it was special to you. And maybe it still is special to you. But the Ephesians have lost that moment. And Christ is like, I remember it. All right. The Israelites were appointed to be God's light-bearing witnesses to the world. However, in their later history, they renounced their love for God and started mistreating and oppressing one another. As a result, God took the privilege of being his light-bearing people from them. A similar punishment could happen to the church in Ephesus. If, if the church does not reflect the love of God, it loses the very reason for its existence and is in danger of having its lampstand removed. Now, I don't want to keep on harping on you or beat a drum here, but I want to say this. The purpose of the church... The reason for our existence is to shine the light of Jesus Christ. If we're not shining the light of Jesus Christ, there's no point for us to exist. Might as well tear down these walls and just do your own thing. Jesus says, you must shine the light of Jesus Christ. That is the reason of your existence. So, some observations. If the Christians in Ephesus would return to their first devotion to Christ, love for humanity would also return. The message to the church in Ephesus is a warning to all Christians whose primary concern is doing the right thing to always keep in mind the central theme of the gospel, the love of God. In other words, Jesus, Jesus came to visit, to visit uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and he got there, and Martha started, 
instantly, as soon as she saw Jesus, I'm sure she was ecstatic. Jesus is coming to my house. Jesus is coming to visit me. I'm sure she was happy. And then it seems to hit women a little harder usually than guys. Oh, man, my dishes. Oh, my floor. My bed. Is my bed made? Is that lamp table right? Is it dusted? Is the plant watered? Yeah, I'm just, you know, trying. I don't, I don't, I praise God for my wife. She's great. Anyways, you understand. Oh, what if he's hungry? I better feed him. And the whole time Jesus is out talking to everybody and she's working excitedly, trying to please Jesus. And Jesus wasn't unhappy with her. Jesus wasn't mad, but she got bitter. And why did she get bitter? Right, because Mary, Mary, that slacker Mary. Mary's never helping. Mary doesn't do the dishes. Mary, why isn't Mary helping me cook? I know the men do that thing, but why is my sister not helping me? Why does she care enough to come help me? So she went to Jesus. And you know the story. Martha, Martha, you're concerned about much. But she's chosen the right thing, and it won't be taken from her. There was a time in my life where I was doing ministry before I was a pastor, and I had started this training program. It was called Fishers of Men. I mean, sorry, it, it started out as Fishers of, Fishers, for men, Fishers of Men, but somebody thought that it should be changed because they didn't think women could be included, so we changed it to Fishers for Men. Um, in the training. And it became a burden. And it became a burden because once a month, I had to come up with training for the people and an outreach activity and all this kind of stuff. And support for it started waning. When we first started, everybody was excited. I mean, we had like 35 people coming to it and we were training and doing all stuff. But support started waning. We got down to like eight people. And I had to keep it going and keep it going and keep it going because the church expected it to keep going. And I'll never forget one morning I was walking into the parking lot. And this, this elder, this older, mature, wise man, he was walking by, and I don't even know if he knew what he was saying to me. But God was speaking to him. God was speaking to me through him. And he said, you know, Jay, it's not your ministry. It's God's ministry. He just lets you be a part of it. I had forgotten that I was doing God's ministry. I thought it was my burden when it was still Jesus' burden. The devil will use anything he can to get our focus off of Jesus Christ. He doesn't care if it's ministry. He doesn't care if it's devotions. He doesn't care if it's helping other people. He doesn't care if it's your child. He doesn't care if it's your spouse. He doesn't care if it's your family members. He doesn't care if it's your work. All these things are good things, and we should be doing them. But when we lose focus of Jesus and focus of our purpose and focus of our mission, they become a burden to us. And we lose our first love as a result. Jesus says, he doesn't notice, he doesn't say, stop working. He says, repent, do your first works. Connect with me on a daily basis. Connect with me on a regular basis. I don't know when that time is for you. It might be the morning for you. Some of you might really struggle waking up in the morning and that special time for you is at night. The point is, as long as you have a time, as long as you have a place, a prayer closet that you go and you sit there and you plead with God and you talk to God and you, you just pour your heart out to him. He's your friend and he loves you and he remembers those experiences with you. They're like gold to him. Just like when my little daughter picked out a candle, it was like a $3 candle and I thought it was the stupidest thing ever, but she gave it to, 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 to her mommy right for her birthday and that thing is on like the center the center cabinet right like right as soon as you walk in you see that thing right it's like a three dollar stupid candle but it's important to her because of who it came from you know you might think that you don't have anything to offer but it's important to jesus he loves that time he remembers it and he's talking to the ephesians and he says repent don't stop doing those works those help you be with me but connect with me before you do them. Because if you don't, it'll be a burden. But if it's an outflow of your heart for Jesus, it's going to be the most precious treasure you have in your life. So next week, we'll move on to Smyrna. Let's pray. Father,
Thank you for the message, Lord. You know, you might not be talking to anybody in here. You might be talking to me. You might be talking to all of us. But Lord, one thing is certain. It feels comfortable. It feels great, Lord. It feels awesome to know that the time we spend with you is so precious to you. You remember it. You etch it into your memory. You store it on your center cabinet in your brain, if you will, Lord, because you just love spending time with us so much. Father, if we've drifted from our first love, reconnect us to you. Bring us back, Lord, and help us. Help us to have that honeymoon experience with you, that first time experience with you all over again in a fresh every single day because you said you'd give it to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.